Assalamu alaikum and uh, selamat petang. Good afternoon. Uh, we will resume the uh, con uh, the conference with the keynote address by Professor Peter Barrett. Um, let me introduce him as uh, one of keynote presenters uh, this afternoon. So it's now it's already three uh, half an hour past three. I will continue with uh, his uh, keynote address, and I would like to introduce him. Introduce him. Uh, he's, uh, Peter is now the president of the UN Established International Council for Research and Innovation in Building and Construction, involving 2,000 experts in 60 countries. Peter is also a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveys, uh, and he has supervised and supported a wide range of postgrad students. To date, he has produced over 170 single volume presentations, uh, single volume publications, rapid papers and reports, and has made over 110 presentations in around 16 countries. Professor Bart has undertaken a wide range of research with an emphasis on management focus around real world problems using a range of hard and soft research methods. Is currently focusing on the theme of revaluing construction with a particular interest in the links between senses, brain, and spaces. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Prof. Peter Barron. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, even. It's a great pleasure to be here, and um, I'm very honored to be making this presentation. The only thing I would like is for it to appear on the screen, which would probably make it more interesting for you, but it will come in a moment, I think. <laughs> um, there are some connections straight away with what your minister was saying. Um, the emphasis on practical research that makes a practical impact, for instance. The centre we have in Salford University called SCREE is established specifically to work with industry, and we don't really see a gap between rigorous academic research and working with industry. We actually see it as very challenging and um, very legitimate research which actually can at the same time have very powerful impacts. So um, there, there doesn't seem in our minds to be that sort of divide and we'd I suppose use Kurt Lewin's thinking about there's nothing as practical as a good theory. Um, if a theory doesn't work in practice then maybe it's not a good theory. Yes, on the, on the Apologies for this. Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to cover, and then by the time the machine behaves itself, um, we'll be able to do it. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview about the CIB, the, what used to be the Council International de Batimont, um, and as president of the CIB, I feel obliged to do that, but it's also a very exciting organisation that I think almost anybody could gain a lot from being a member of. Then I'll say something about revaluing construction in general. It's been a theme that's been going for several years, and We've looked at quite a lot of different countries, um, but then I'll move into the um, perspective on revaluing construction in Malaysia in particular. Um, just yesterday, we had a workshop um, looking at the issue of revaluing construction in Malaysia with very many different stakeholders. And um, what I did was work last night and this morning to try and feed forward um, the perspective that came through, and it will be interesting to see if it makes sense to you. And then lastly, um, if there's time, I'll make some connection to environmental issues um, because I think it's a major, major issue for Malaysia, it's a major issue for the world, and maybe it's interesting to think, well, yes, making the industry more effective and efficient is good, but can it also address issues like sustainability? And then I'll draw some very short conclusions. So, now we have a picture, that helps, I guess, um, and I've just covered the first slide, which is what I'm going to be talking about. So first of all, the CIB. This is the International Council for Research and Innovation in Building and Construction. Um, it has a strange history. It was established after the Second World War to more efficiently and effectively rebuild Europe. Um, so that started with quite a tight focus, and it was the major national research institutions that were members of the CIB. Since that time, it's grown so that it covers the whole world. We have members from more than 60 countries, and um, it's a global network of both those research institutes, but also many universities and also leading companies like Arabs, for instance. And so it's a very good mix of um, different players, and they make up a network 
Um, and the advantage, I guess, is that you can very easily make connections with people with similar interests anywhere in the world very rapidly. We also try to be a global source of high quality information and so if you go to the website um, you can see that we actually give everything away free. We've made a decision as a CIB board not to try and um, charge for information but to actually be a place where you can find it and find it freely and learn from it and hopefully provide information back to us which we can then translate to other people as well. As I say, the UN has been established for over 50 years. It's got 2,000 built environment experts at least in the various organisations um, involved. It covers many countries and it has a lot of working groups and task groups. And these are specialist subject areas like organisation and management of construction or um, something like quality in construction. And across those working groups and task groups it has proactive themes. So in essence what the CIB tries to do is cover hard technical subjects, soft social subjects, it tries to look at the construction industry but also the built environment in the broader sense. Just give you some examples from sustainable development of the types of groups we have in the CIB. You can see right from hard things like earthquake engineering um, through to green buildings and the law. Very different subjects represented so almost anybody can find a group that actually connects with their interests. And then there are a whole load of other things like IT in construction as well. So the website is there, it's cibworld.nl, the headquarters is in the Netherlands, hence the NL, um, and there's lots of information on, in there if you would like to look. Another thing we're doing, and, and it's sort of just grown of its own momentum, is student chapters. So many of the universities involved in the CIB have a student chapter where, if you like, the next generation of construction researchers can connect with their own global network. And that's been going extremely well. And there's a list of the current um, student chapters. Just to say something about the proactive themes, and this will also be my last slide, so I'll use this again later. Um, we have a way of saying, well, we've got lots of specialist groups. How can we bring them together around major challenges? Your minister was talking about challenge orientated research. In a sense, this is the same thing. And we've used a, a framework which goes from macro to micro, from demand to supply. And then we've overlaid that with different perspectives. So let's say a society view from the top left hand corner there, an industry view, um, a client view or a project perspective. And then within those boxes we've identified major challenges that we think as a C an organisation, as the CIB, we should actually bring our experts together to try and address. So one is sustainable construction that's been going for many years and we now run the, SC, sorry, the SB series of conferences with the UN, um, which is a major activity for us. Another is client-driven performance. In that area we've done a lot on performance-based building. Um, with mixed results, performance-based building sounds like a good idea. For instance, one of the first countries to move in that area was New Zealand, and they've had significant problems with performance-based building, but not enough education so that people could properly take advantage of the flexibility. So actually designing to performance standards rather than regulations can be dangerous, but it can also open up possibilities for innovation. Another area is revaluing construction. This started out as re-engineering construction. This is how can the industry be more effective and efficient and um, we've spent a long while and I spent a long while working in this area to try and work out what the problems are. And again, your minister mentioned traditions, those sorts of things which can be good, can be a way of capturing knowledge, but can also be a problem when they mean everybody is fixed in their positions and it's very difficult for anybody to move. So, I mean, we've come across the concept of lock-in, where everybody has to perform their roles in the normal way. If anybody changes, they get blamed if it goes wrong. And so it becomes difficult for any one player to change, and in fact you need to change the environment they're all working within. And the most recent one is integrated design solutions. In fact, we're calling it integrated design and delivery solutions. This is connected with BIM, it's connected with the technology of taking the design information right the way through to the use phase and trying to avoid everything falling through the gaps in between. So these are our four proactive themes that within the CIB we're giving emphasis to. I'm going to move on now to say something specifically about one of those, about revaluing construction. Um, this has been going since 2001. Um, it's, it's been quite a, a hectic programme of work over that time. 
and we've looked at several different countries and in 2005 we got to the point where we made an initial statement about what we thought the main problems were. So that initial work covered five countries, the UK, Canada, USA, Singapore and Australia and the work that I'm going to tell you about just in a moment draws on the experience in those five countries and then I'm going to add on to that um, the, the outcomes of yesterday's workshop in Malaysia. The book um, that summarizes a lot of this information came out in 2007 and 8, together with a, a short publication which enables you to get a summary of the work that's available on the website. And more recently, I've been getting rather obsessed, and it was mentioned in the introduction, with senses, brain and spaces. This is the notion that where does the funda what, what is the fundamental value um, of sorry, I get this right what's the fundamental unit of value in the built environment? And as far as I can see, just taking a logical look at it, it's how we experience individual spaces through our senses, interpreted by our brains. And that might sound a bit strange, but it's very, very tangible. Um, you know, in America they've done studies of schools, and schools with high levels of daylighting compared with those with low levels of daylighting, when they do regression analysis to take out all the other factors, the students learn 20% faster, literally 20% faster. And then they try and repeat it, and they don't get that improvement because noise gets in the way in a different location. So we're talking about fragile but very, very significant impacts. And you'll be aware of the work that's been done in hospitals where by having views of nature, people get better quicker, they need, they need fewer painkillers, they're less likely to come back. Very tangible impacts if we design spaces to make people um, healthier and more productive. And so that's something that I think is actually very important and gets rather overlooked at the moment. And then, of course, in 2009, yesterday, um, a workshop in Malaysia to try and say, well, does this stuff all stack up for you? Does it make sense for you? And later on, I'll give you a comparison of what came out of that workshop with what came out of the previous work. But first of all, the findings from the, from the five um, workshops that we did first. These are the typical words that come out to, tip, to describe the construction industry. I don't know if they make sense to you or if they fit in the Malaysian context. The people at the workshop yesterday said, yeah, actually, these are quite often the sorts of words that we see. Confrontational, risk averse, cutthroat competition. I think I heard that mentioned earlier. Um, uh, organisational amnesia. In other words, people do a good project and then they do a bad project next. How did that happen? They must have forgotten something in between. Um, lack of vision, lack of trust. So those are quite common words in all of the five countries I've looked at before and at the workshop yesterday they came out as not untypical um, as descriptors of the Malaysian construction industry. That's a problematic position to be coming from. That's an industry that sort of beats itself up and has lots of difficulties and somehow we've got to get to a position where we have much more positive words to describe the sector. And I hope by the time I get to the end of my presentation I'll be able to give you some more positive words because this isn't a good starting point, um, but we're trying to work out why that is, and that's what revaluing construction is looking at, really. So a simple definition of revaluing construction is to say that somehow we're trying to get to the position where the value jointly created is maximised. If we do that, we're making a big cake, basically. That's the argument. We want to work out how to maximise the value that's created by the sector. But then the second leg of it is that we want to make sure that the rewards are equitably distributed. So it's no point if the client beats up the industry and does well and gets lots of value, but the industry actually doesn't make a profit and can't survive. It's not good if the industry rips off the client, makes lots of profit, but the client is being exploited. And so it's a matter of trying to work out how we can maximise the cake and then carve it up in a fair way, a sustainable way, between the main players. Doing an analysis of the um, work with the um, people in the five countries was quite complicated. Um, I actually see it as a, an interactive system of different pressures all connected with each other. I'm not expecting you to read that and um, don't ask me to read it out either because it's a bit small. But the scene it's showing you is that at the bottom there are driving forces below the line at the bottom there. These are things which actually can give you some leverage to make progress. At the top there are restraining forces, these are problems, it could be lack of trust, it could be various things. And in the middle are actions, 
And so this is a compilation of the five previous workshops, and the actions draw on the driving forces and attack the restraining forces. And the argument is that if you can do that, it can move up the performance of the industry um, by pulling and shoving in lots of different sorts of ways. So that was, if you like, a summary of the analysis. Um, it then, of course, had to be manipulated into something more digestible, and this is that beginning to happen. And in the middle there, you can see some um, boxes beginning to stand out. And ultimately, the summary, if you like, from the first five um, workshops looked like this. It's what I would call the infinity model. Um, it's got seven particular areas that need to be addressed. They are connected, and if you address them all, then I think we can expect to make significant progress. I'm going to go through these one at a time, but you can see how they, they come together, first of all, because I know if I go through one at a time, I don't show you the whole thing, it's a bit confusing. So if we start at the start, the first thing is a holistic idea of construction. Um, this is a very, very significant issue. This is saying if we look at construction as building stuff, then we can't really improve very much. We have to look at construction as creating the built environment that actually supports activities in society. So we have to see it in a much broader sense than just building stuff. And if we do that, then we start to get concerned about the use phase, we start to get concerned about facilities management, we start to get concerned about the sorts of issues I was saying about schools and hospitals, and we start to draw in a whole load of people that otherwise we might not consult. Within the UK, we've done an analysis, or a colleague of mine did an analysis, of the SIC categorisation of um, the industry. So this is the economic categorisation of the industry. In uh, Malaysia, I think it's 6 or 7% of GDP, something like that. In the UK, it's something like 7 or 8% of GDP. If you look at the SIC categorisation, um, what it actually says is that it includes contractors. But it doesn't include architects. It doesn't include facilities managers. It doesn't include a whole load of things that are actually very closely connected with construction and certainly very closely connected with the built environment more generally. And so what we've done in the UK is that we've reassessed the SIC categories and instead of saying it's 8% of GDP construction, we say the built environment sector is 20% of GDP. And we can prove it. We can prove it by a, an explicit analysis of the SIC categories. And suddenly we're talking to politicians saying we're talking about a fifth of the economy. And it's a huge part of how the, how the whole country works. And not only that, it's a fifth of the economy that creates the environment within which the rest of the economy lives and works. And so if we can make it better, it has a massive multiplier effect. And that's now what it says in our UK um, construction strategy. And the argument is, though, that if you start to look more broadly like that, it means that you get many more opportunities for improving the performance of the sector. If you just think of building things, there are limits to what you can do. If you think about creating better built environments for society, then you get different players involved. You can unleash a lot of um, latent potential. So that's what a holistic idea of construction means. It looks quite harmless, but it's actually a very important factor. The next thing is actually trying to create some sort of shared vision amongst stakeholders. And of course, if you take that holistic view, then you include the clients, you include the facilities managers, you include you know, a whole range of people beyond just the contractors. Next one is something about the balance of markets and social capital. Hidden behind this particular um, part of the diagram is the whole problem with actually appointing contractors or designers on lowest cost. Um, my friends in the Netherlands, for instance, would say that um, competition is good, but is more competition better? And we sort of come to the conclusion in lots of countries that you can get to the point where there's so much competition, it's so vicious, that it's actually counterproductive. And you get to the stage where the person that makes the biggest mistake gets the job. And then they spend the rest of the project getting their money back by being clever quantity surveyors. Something like that. Um, and it becomes contentious, conflictual. And obviously that can be a problem. They've done work in America looking at actually what is the value that's tied up in a lack of trust and all the competition that goes on. And they found that it's something between 8 and 12% of the contract value. They compared contracts that had very, very um, vicious um, clauses in them, loading all the li liability onto the contractors or the consultants with those that actually shared it much more fairly and where there was a good level of trust. 8 to 12% of the con contract value was 
actually connected with a lack of trust. So we're talking about large amounts of money here if you can actually drive out that problem. And that's an area where I think there's a lot of potential. And it's not a technical area, it's a sort of legal stroke social area. And of course it's things like partnering, PPP, those sorts of things. Um, and, and there's been a lot of development around those issues um, of late. Next one is then, if we can get the right sort of environment through the right sort of procurement, can we actually be more dynamic about our decisions and information right the way through from briefing, right the way through to the use phase? And again, just to give you an example of the sort of value that gets lost here, NIST in the US did a major study on inter interoperability, and they found that if you look at information dropping through the cracks at each stage from design through to use, at the non-housing sector part of the economy, um, they were losing $18 billion a year just by losing information that had to be recreated. And the people who were losing most of it were the clients, and the people who had most potential to fix it were the designers. So there's an asymmetry there, and there's a danger that it doesn't actually get sorted out. But of course the clients can stamp their foot and actually insist on getting the information through, and that's beginning to happen. It's beginning to happen in the US, it's beginning to happen in Finland, and it's beginning to happen with some major clients in the UK as well. So actually making that information and knowledge flow right the way through cumulatively to the use phase, huge potential to actually capture and retain value. Evolving knowledge and attitudes is a simple one. It's just saying there's no point in having the occasional project that goes well. We actually need to educate in good practice so that everybody progressively understands the value and behaves differently. And this has to do with education in universities. But in the studies we were doing in the five countries, it's education of senior people in the industry, um, it's education of clients because they have a pivotal role, and um, it's education of um, students, of course, as I mentioned, maybe so they don't come out so specialist, but they come out a bit more used to working with other people. So that takes us back to the shared vision, and that's all to do with looking in at the industry and enhancing its performance. I'll quickly go around the other side. The other side is something to do with the awareness of systemic contribution. This is actually saying that we see construction as dirty, disruptive and dangerous. The usual description using the three Ds and it's true to some extent that it is, it is a problem when people dig up the road or when they dig foundations. But what seems to happen is people notice that activity and then they forget about the benefits that flow. They forget about the fact that we get the schools, we get the hospitals, we get the homes, we get the roads. We enjoy them for decades afterwards, but somehow that's not accounted for. People only remember the disruption, and they attach that to the construction industry. And we need to make a huge effort to actually remind people about the full value that actually comes through. And I'll come back to that briefly in a moment. And the last thing to say, I suppose, is that if we can do all of those things, we do need to actively promote um, the full value delivered to society. We do need to pick up all of those aspects and we need to make a positive noise about the industry. And that's been happening in a strange way in the UK, for instance. There are quite a lot of programmes about how to improve your home, um, where you can see tradesmen being really, really useful. And there are programmes about the value of your property. And actually, I don't know whether it's connected with that. It's partly connected with IT not being seen as a good industry. but. Over the last five years, um, applicants for courses at our university have gone up something like 70% every year. So we're suddenly seeing a renaissance of interest in the sector, and maybe it's because people are beginning to see property as an interesting thing where you can make a good career. So this side of the diagram has to do with looking out and the perceptions of the industry. And it's actually saying, think big, you know, think of the industry as the built environment. Think of it as a fifth of the economy. Think of it as the thing that makes people better, makes people learn well. Um, think of it as the thing that's exciting and dynamic. Um, maybe these aren't the normal words that come out. So that's revaluing construction. That's the way it came through um, from the five workshops before. We've got a website, which is, which is at the CIB website, cibworld.nl. And on there, again, all the information that we have is free. So these are reports from the different countries, um, the summaries and so on. So you're welcome to have a look at that. One of the things is a simple, pretty looking brochure, which again is on the website, um, which does give just a very simple summary of the main, the main details. So you may find that interesting just to sort of get the argument and maybe use that amongst some of your colleagues. I mentioned awareness of systemic contribution and I was going to come back to that. Um, it struck me that you've got um, the Petronas Towers. 
Very, very striking. I'd heard about them. I hadn't visited them. So this picture is from a couple of days ago. And um, it sort of started me thinking about, so what do the Petronas Towers do for Malaysia? They, of course, are an amazing technical achievement. They, of course, provide high-grade office accommodation, commercial space, retail space, and that whole economic thing that goes with them. Um, but in addition, they're a source of pride. They are actually a beautiful thing, aren't they? Especially at night. They're very, very attractive. And they're a symbol for Kuala Lumpur as well. So you get all sorts of value out of our built environment. And in um, the US, when they did the big dig in Boston, they got increased rental values, increased, increased va rates from the area. They got increased, um, sorry, decreased crime. They got better transport system. You know, there's a whole range of things. And one of the things that doesn't happen, I suppose, is nobody adds it up. What I've shown on the right-hand side is Media City in the UK. Similar thing, the built environment being used to transform an area. So this is in Salford. This is next to our university. And um, this is the last pier in what was a Dockland area that became very depressed but has now been rejuvenated. So this is Pier 9. And on Pier 9, a private developer is spending £550 million pounds, um, building Media City. The main tenant is the BBC, they're moving five of their departments up and they'll become 10% um, of 15,000 people working there. So it's an amazingly ambitious um, activity and it's using the built environment as a symbol of change for the BBC, as a regeneration of the area and as an opportunity to change a complete sector. So it's just to remind you that the built environment isn't just about building, it's about changing the world. Right next door to Media City in May, um, I'm running the CIB World Congress. By being president, at the end of my presidency, I have to have a congress and I have to host it. And um, the title for the congress is Building a Better World. And so that's, if you like, linking with this whole revaluing construction thing, that we actually want to contribute to the world. We don't want to just build buildings and make money. Of course, we have to do that, but we also want to improve the world that we're in. And it will be right next door to Media City. And, um, Again, the website is there, cib2010.org, and it's not too late to get an abstract in. <laughs> so for academics in the world, it, in the room, it's still possible um, to put an abstract in. We have about 860 um, abstracts already, so it's going to be a big event with lots of people and some major challenges from the World Bank, from the UN, from the OECD, that we're trying to respond to as well. So let's um, pause for thought. Let's look back one day. So this is the workshop yesterday um, where we had a range of people, um, lots of bottles of water. We tried to take a picture that didn't have too many bottles of water in, but there's bottles of water <laughs> everywhere in the room. And um, we got them working in an interactive way to address the notion of how to take things forward positively for the sector in Malaysia. We were doing it in the context of your um, construction industry master plan. We really ought to test you whether you know these, but uh, you should all know these um, and be able to recite them. I don't think I could, but there are seven thrusts. Integrating the industry, improving the image, addressing quality, health and safety and the like, um, human resource capability, research and development, IT or ICT, and addressing globalization. So they're very sensible subjects, and the idea is, well, they're what we're trying to do. How are we going to do it, and how are we doing it? How well are we doing at it so far? So the programme, which I won't go around in detail, the programme was quite interactive. It started off with some introductory material, and then the idea was that in the first session, we took, if you see down the side there, there's clients, designers, contractors, and suppliers. We took the clients, designers, contractors, and suppliers, and we kept them together. And we said, tell us what the drivers and the constraints are from your point of view. And so they worked in groups, where they could create those drivers and restraining forces, um, we could collect them, and then we could provide those back as a whole set of a lot of drivers and restraining forces. And then in the afternoon session, um, we mixed them up. And we said, come on clients, talk to the contractors, talk to the designers, and come up with some actions that would actually practically build on the drivers, practically address the restraining forces. And um, we had a good discussion. We can compare it with other countries. It was as good as any discussion we had, and, um, and there were some interesting insights coming out. Of course, it's not long since that workshop, so it hasn't been long to digest it, but I'm going to give you a quick reflection on um, what I think happened. 
So if you remember this idea of a cognitive map where we've got the drivers, the restrainers and the actions in the middle, um, this is the cognitive map from yesterday, cleaned up a little bit. So it looks like that. And um, it may be difficult to read or a bit difficult to read, but um, on the left hand side here, for instance, on the drivers, there's a notion that if we could have assurance for prompt payment, for instance, that could make a big difference. And um, on the restrainers, there's a, let's say, and as an example, a worry about poor coordination of the government authorities. That it's actually quite complex to deal with the government and it's quite difficult to get um, a single strong view from them. And so this is what came out and what I've done is colour code it to make it simple for you, I suppose, or as simple as I can because I know it's difficult to digest from where you are. So the pink boxes are all to do um, with really quite practical things to do with prompt payment and the SIPA legislation that's coming through and making sure that really, really works. The notion of using two-stage tendering, two-stage open tendering, not direct negotiation ex except exceptionally, um, but also not lowest price tendering. So you're actually talking about two-stage where you select first by quality and then you select by price. Um, that was seen as essential to avoid what was termed in the, in the workshop, which was very open, cronyism, um, and concerns about the jobs not being allocated to the best, the best people. And then the notion of using performance standards more strictly connects to that in terms of selection. So this is quality standards, this is the um, GBI, and the notion that actually you use those sort, that sort of data to make sure that the people you're dealing with are as good as possible. If you look at the blue boxes, they're a different set of things. They're people actually saying we want to have consultation, we want to have a wider range of people coming together. At the moment, it seems that there is a bit of an emphasis on the contracting side, and it actually could be much broader with clients and with designers and so on. And if they could get together, perhaps building on the Building Industry President's Council, it would be possible to have a rounded view, a bit along the lines of the, the bigger conception I was talking about. Alongside that, if there was a single ministry, this is a wish list, if there was a single ministry for construction or maybe for the built environment, it could be very, very powerful. If it was actually saying to itself, we're responsible for a fifth of the economy, maybe it's very, very logical too. Um, and then there's the notion of a, an alignment of the um, activities, the tripartite alignment was what we called it during the workshop. This is industry government and universities around the research agenda and some sort of shift towards um, research that has a more immediate impact, a bit like your minister was describing um, just a moment ago. So this business of connecting people and gaining a consensus and keeping that consensus going um, came out very clearly. In the other countries, this is exactly the same. We're having to have that forum where you can actually have the discussion and you can keep the consensus going is very important. And with revaluing construction in most countries, we're talking about at least 10 years, and then it has to keep going, and it has to be rejuvenated at various points. So this sort of business about a body of influential people creating and maintaining a consensus is very, very important. The green is a bit to do with technology, I guess. Um, part of it is um, the CIDB, and it's doing this, creating a comprehensive portal for the industry, um, a user-friendly portal with lots of um, relevant and up-to-date information. And then there's the notion of um, systemic asset management, um, and this could connect to assessment systems, it could connect to building information management systems, and the notion is that you can take a, a more global view by using those sorts of technologies. And that leaves the yellow box, which is um, industrialised building systems, about which everybody in Malaysia seems to be very interested. My colleague Mustafa Arshawi is over there, and I'm sure it's because he's been talking to you endlessly about them. But um, industrial bu industrialised building systems seen as a way to modernise the industry, basically. Um, it wasn't actually seen as an economic driver, that it would be cheaper or whatever. It's that it could address labour problems, it could address image problems, and it could address health and safety problems. And so um, industrialised building systems, as I say, seen as a way of addressing the image and modernising the sector. So the workshop was good, and the workshop came up with some interesting things. Um, I'm going to circulate it to the people involved and to the um, people in the universities I was working with, and they can fill in the gaps. But that's where we're up to so far on that. And just connecting that back to the infinity model, yes, there is a desire to take a more holistic view of construction. There's a huge desire for forums, for a wide range of stakeholders to get together. And there is this desire to go beyond um, 
what was often called cronyism in the discussion, but not towards lowest price tendering, but to something more sophisticated in between. So that's the balance of markets and social capital. And then an aspiration to inject a whole life perspective into the decision making and information flows, and maybe linking that to the industrialized building systems approach. And then the knowledge of, sorry, the issue of knowledge and attitudes. That came out quite clearly, and it wasn't about education, educating senior people in the industry or whatever. Um, it was about educating the whole supply chain about green issues and maybe also orientating university research more towards impact. So actually that educational dimension there. Awareness of systemic contribution came up not very strongly, but it did come up in discussion through the phrase systemic asset management. So the notion of actually seeing the thing right the way through to asset management rather than stopping off at construction and just hoping it works out later. And of course the promotion of the full value delivered is the sum of all those above. If all of those were working effectively, then you've got a very strong message to give out to those interested in the sector. Just a few quick comparisons now with what came up in the five countries we've looked at previously, and this one is quite similar. The argument here is that we're looking for levers for change, we're looking at who can do stuff. And in the frameworks area, which if you like is how you create the context for construction to go on, you have industry and clients and you have government. And in a way, government are a major client, of course. Linked to that, in the projects area, you have procurers. And you also have project teams. And I've shown project teams dotted because actually, individual project teams have very limited capacity to do anything if the context they're working within isn't changed. And um, that's quite shocking in a way because we can say to people working on projects, just do better, you know, work harder, work differently. They won't do it if they're not in a different context if the procurement doesn't work in such a way that it establishes a project so that it can work differently. In the knowledge and attitude arena, very much more abstract. So this is about society, education and research. Quite hard to take positive dynamic action there, but you can take long-term action in terms of education. So what I would say to you is the main levers are to do with an industry client forum, to do with the government acting as a client, but also as a player in that forum, and procurers practically setting up different contract conditions so that the people working on projects can work differently. Otherwise, it's this locking argument. They can't behave differently because they're working in the normal context, and that has to be broken somehow. In terms of a locus for accelerating change, this came out of the previous work. It seems to actually fit Malaysia pretty well too. A strong call for a government policy lead, a strong call for institutional forums that link clients and the supply and the um, demand side, and a call for something that aligns industry and university and the research activity. So if you can get some sort of balanced approach where all of those players have a voice, then it can be a very good place to create that consensus. This was a more complicated diagram saying, so who can do what? This came out of the previous work, and we're talking about industry and the client, government, procurers, etc. And you can see the countries across the top, and it varied from country to country, workshop to workshop, what emphasis was given. This is my very quick um, assessment of what came out of the workshop yesterday, which is that there is quite a lot the industry and client could and would want to do if they were given a voice. So this is that broader range of stakeholders, um, and there's also a heavy emphasis on what the government could do. This varies from country to country. In Malaysia there seems to be an appetite for the government to be quite dynamic and quite forceful in getting things moving, and I guess they've got the capability to do it too. So that can actually be very positive, so long as they identify the right things. And so it sounds to me as though some of the actions that have been taken over the last couple of years um, through the CIDB, through CREAM, are very positive, and there's a potential to accelerate that. We were hearing about um, the Green Building Index and how that's being used and how subsidies are being given to companies to actually take positive action. Um, these are quite dynamic things that aren't happening in other countries, so I think you can be proud of those. Not so much on the project team, some on education and research, but it's more passive, some on society. So the emphasis really is at a strategic level within Malaysia, and there is an opportunity to build on what's already there, but broaden it and drive it forward very strongly. Just to finish on revaluing construction, um, the seven areas from the infinity diagram are shown along the bottom there. This is just trying to say how we could create some more positive words. Do you remember I started with some quite negative words? Um, this is saying, well, you know, if we actually move up from that, 
from those seven areas and say what society impacts could we achieve. Um, the words are there, I'll let you read those, but I'll pick, out, I'll pick out the positive words that seem to appear. So for instance, um, excitement. You know, if we promote the full value of the industry, we can create excitement. Importance. If people understand the systemic contribution of construction, they'll realise that it's very important. If they think of it as a fifth of the economy, they'll realise it's very important. Words like professional, ethical, sophisticated, skillful, they all come out naturally from the consequences of addressing those seven areas in the infinity diagram. And so my argument would be that we have to, um, we have, to have a sustained effort to try and improve on all of those fronts, and they will slowly connect up more strongly. I think the position in Malaysia has a slightly different flavour from some others, but I actually do feel that the model and the approach does fit well. And over time, we can get to a position where these nice words appear in people's brains when we say the construction or built environment sector, rather than all those nasty words right back at the start. And that would be a huge achievement, because then we start to get the very best people coming into the industry, and it becomes a self-confirming cycle. Just very quickly, I want to say something about a link to the green imperative. I mean, you know, the construction industry just uses so much energy, so much resources, and creates so much pollution that there is a heavy responsibility on us to try and be better on the um, sustainable development front. And what I want to do is just link this with a thing called the four C's that we came out with from the previous analysis. This is a, this is a model of what does an exemplary project look like? And I suppose what I'm saying is I'm going to give you an example of a project that addressed very, very strongly um, green issues, and it did it by being, if you like, an exemplar of how revaluing construction would look. One of the interesting things is that it, de it depends on having a strong focus, a strong constraint that actually drives people to work differently. Um, but at the same time, it has to include flexibility so they can work differently. So it's like a really, really difficult task plus flexibility. So the 4Cs model says we start with a constraint. That sounds like a negative thing, I'll come back to that. It doesn't have to be a negative thing, and we'll, I'll give you an example in a moment. That constraint means that people have to collaborate differently. Because it's a huge problem, they have to say, what are we going to do? Forget the rule book, we're going to collaborate differently. Because they collaborate diff differently, it engenders creativity. And at the same time, it seems to engender a view that looks more broadly. This is to the community, the users of the building, but also the community beyond the building. So a much broader perspective about what the building, what the construction project can do. And these are the features that came out of analysing about 18 different examples of exemplary projects. And one in particular was from Australia. So this was from Queensland, and it was this building, which is a government building, where the imperative was that it had to be absolutely brilliant in terms of environmental performance. And so the whole project was orientated around how are we going to achieve that. And some interesting things happened. So it's a four-storey commercial building, and the constraint was that it had to be at least a four-star rating under their particular Australian system. But it also had to be commercially viable, so it couldn't be a brilliantly environmentally friendly building that didn't work. So it had to be commercially viable and accommodate a high churn rate. Interestingly, they orientated the whole project team around the facilities manager. So the facilities management team became the client, became the driving force behind the project, because they were going to have to work with it when it was actually um, built. And they made a huge effort to create honest, open relationships, a shared vision, local cultures. That sounds all soft stuff, but it was practical things they did at the start of the project to make those things come about. Lots of creativity resulted. They were very proud of their thermal wheel. Um, it reduced the plant size by 25%. But they also made practically everything within the building recyclable. So you wouldn't know it really by looking at it, but almost anything in that building can be recycled so that in the long term um, it won't go to waste. With a community, they used local firms and materials, and then they made a big effort to put Aboriginal art in the, in the spaces around the building as a payback to the community, so it made them feel ownership of the building. So that was all quite a lot of investment, quite a lot of things done differently. You could imagine it would make it an expensive project. Well, they reached a five-star level rating, not a four-star, so it says plus 15%, so it was even better than that. It was exemplary in terms of its environmental performance. Um, and they were saving six dollars 
per metre squared per year because of its low cost of running as a building. So a very, very tangible payback to the government there. Completed on time, that's quite unusual for projects, isn't it? Um, and $400,000 below budget. So despite the fact they were achieving huge things on the environmental side, they actually achieved fantastic things on how the project as a whole went as well. And they minimised pollution, dust, noise, runoff, all those issues which tend not to get looked at. And that cost money to do, but even so, they were still below budget. So I suppose my argument would be that if we can get a revalued industry, projects that are done in a revalued way, then we can achieve this sort of thing on the environmental side as well. We can achieve this sort of thing on the quality, the cost side as well. It's not as though we're doing it as a separate thing, we're doing it to achieve better buildings, better projects. I mentioned constraints right, right at the start of this 4C things. It seems funny seeing a constraint in a positive way. Um, constraints have to be stated very explicitly, very clearly, and they have to become the driver for the project. So it could be a deadline in terms of time, it could be this environmental thing, it could be a cost problem, it could be we need to knock 30% off the cost, I don't know what. It has to be convincing and compelling, and then there has to be huge flexibility in terms of how people are allowed to react to it. If you have a hard constraint and then no flexibility, it's a disaster. If you have a hard constraint and then allow people to be creative, it can work very well. So it was interesting just to see those projects which came out of people's experience as the best projects they'd worked on, um, giving us that sort of message. Right, last slide. Back to the original um, four themes from the CIB. Um, I now want to just put things, stand back a bit and put things in the context of the world economic crisis. I think it must be the same for Malaysia, that you've been affected, maybe not as much as the UK, the US or whatever. We've been badly affected in the UK. And one of the reactions is to suddenly start noticing the built environment as being a useful lever for change. So there's a lot of investment in many countries in the built environment, in construction, on infrastructure projects um, to improve the economy, to stimulate the economy. And one of the things they're doing, which is smart, is also linking environmental imperatives as well. So they're sort of saying you, have, you, you can build more buildings, but they have to be green. And that's, that's quite sensible. So there's quite a bit of that happening, spend, but on energy efficiency and low carbon solutions in the built environment. And that's interesting. It's nice that the built environment is being seen as important again. Certainly in the Europe, EC, European community, that's the case. There's a big push on this. Um, and there's this added wrinkle of low carbon. What I'll say is that that's good, but it's not really good enough, that we should be looking a lot beyond that. We should also be saying when we're spending this money, and at the same time we should be creating really, really good environments for people to live and work in. And that's not really getting the attention that it should. In addition, we should be driving new technologies through the industry on the back of ma massive government expenditure, um, and we're not really doing that. We're just in a hurry to build schools and roads. And the last thing we should be doing as a legacy for what is a huge investment in many countries is we should be getting a better industry for the long term, a more effective and efficient industry um, that is revalued, that is re-engineered, that actually is fit for the future. So if we could do all of that as well as just spend money, it would be good, we'd regenerate the economy and we'd make progress, but we'd also be investing for the future. And that's what I hope we can do. We're doing it in some countries, but it'd be good if we could do it much more generally. Thank you very much.